entities in nature. And this analysis can uh, deal with questions like which structures do we need to describe the spatial arrangement of objects, uh, temporal aspects, all that. It's basically trying to uh, think about the structures that exist between um, uh, objects in our environment. And a typical example of ontology in philosophy is the attempt to analyze uh, basic patterns of such relationships like part-whole theories. Um, what does it mean that something is a part of something else? Is wheat to the same degree a part of uh, chocolate cake than an engine is part of a motor and similar things? And this is a very uh, valuable exercise um, because if you find respective patterns that are valid across contexts, across times, across uh, cultural uh, bias, then it may be very helpful for describing phenomena for encoding uh, information. So thinking about how the world is actually structured is a worthwhile exercise. Um, most of you will know this famous, well, I think anybody will know this, everybody will know this famous uh, quote by um, Tom Gruber from 1995 that an ontology was an explicit specification of a conceptualization. I think Tim, uh, Chris Welty asked at the last ISWC made a poll of how many of the people who ever quoted this definition in a paper actually read the full paper from 1995 and it was a disaster, I think. Here's the full section and it clearly says that the term is borrowed from philosophy. It was a handy word for computer scientists in need of a new term for describing um, that formally specifying the basic assumptions about a domain um, could, uh, that, that these artifacts could help the exchange of knowledge bases. So the early computer scientists bearing the word ontologies in, their, um, in mind, they knew they had taken a word from a different community and were using it because it was a handy, a handy new word for describing what they were interested in. Basically specifying the basic assumptions um, about the environment, about the systems, so that if you encode large knowledge bases, you could exchange them across systems. So I think it's important to understand, uh, I'm probably too young to really speak about this and I see many people in the audience who have a decade, at least a decade more of experience in that field. So please kill me when I leave stage. But basically my understanding is that at that time you had the problem that acquiring knowledge for intelligent systems was an expensive and difficult task as it is still today. Now you had different research groups working on intelligent systems and they could not exchange their huge rule bases, their huge knowledge bases, if, if it was unclear whether they are built on the same fundamental assumptions. So you had a physics a, um, a system about behavior of physical objects and one was using Newtonian physics and another one was using any other branch of physics. And if it's not clear that the um, that the knowledge bases refer to the same formal basic mindset, then you cannot exchange them. Okay. So now when you, when you write down your basic assumptions about the domain, the elements that exist and the uh, core axioms that hold for these elements, then you can narrow down the possible interpretations so that it's more likely that if a knowledge base is compatible with this formal specification, um, it can be transferred across systems. But again, the important thing is the early researchers knew that the term ontology in computer science was a borrowed word. If you read modern papers, you will often find submissions, the younger the authors, the worse, that basically say that like ontology is a branch of philosophy and the semantic web or something like that. So they say ontologies are but basically, what we are doing in computer science is the same what the philosophers are doing when they think about what existence means and which basic patterns um, exist. There are, of course, branches of research where, where there, there are closer ties to philosophy than, 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 um, uh, than others. So, for example, the more conceptual modeling-minded research on ontologies is still 
solidly rooted and working on the basic philosophical questions, like, for example, having a model of uh, spatiotemporal relationships is something where you maybe use philosophical techniques um, and rely on, on, on the body of literature in that field to axiomatically specify the basic um, properties of objects in space or time. But mainstream ontology research in particular, the closer it gets to the semantic web and to formal languages, tends to strip off this root, uh, this, this grounding in conceptual modeling and philosophy almost completely, so that you will find computer scientists with a strong formal background who mainly see that ontologies are formal specifications of some models. So sets of axioms are ontologies, which leaves out the, uh, the um, root um, or basically breaks the link to, to uh, the conceptual modeling, the, the history of conceptual modeling. Now, in some classic papers, like uh, Guarino's paper from 1998, he uh, very nicely describes that ontologies try to approximate the intended models so that the, um, by means of um, axioms, you turn unintended interpretations you render them contradictions so that basically the axiomatic um, account of the ontology would prevent you from misunderstanding elements um, uh, of that ontology or making statements that clash with the uh, perspective on the domain um, by the authors of the ontology. Important uh, finding in here is already that ontologies never specify meaning. What they do is they exclude unintended meaning by formal means and other means so that you can spot that something is going wrong, is, is wrong because it would lead to a contradiction. So if you, for example, say these two classes are disjoint with using a formal axiom and you find data that you find entities that seem to be instances of both types, um, then you see that something is wrong. Either the ontology is wrong or the data is wrong. There is a contradiction. But ontologies don't really help you encode meaning um, uh, in the narrow sense. Now, one of the early applications of ontologies was, uh, or the, the intended applications were, uh, was systems interoperability, so that, for example, data from one system could be processed in another system. And if these systems use the same underlying assumptions about the entities, they can safely process um, uh, the respective data. For example, you can consider a student a subclass of a human or a role of a human. If you consider it a subclass of a human, which, as many will agree, is bad modeling in here, but still is very frequently found, then a student can have a date of birth. If you model students as roles that humans have, then the student entity may have an enrollment date and a graduation date, but not a date of birth, because the date of birth is a property of the human, not of the student. And then you see that a stu you can stop being a student without stopping being a human, at least in... Uh, may there may be academics that think that this is not true, but that's another story. But quite clearly, if the, um, if the specifications are only approximate and incomplete, it is still possible that uh, you have two models used in two different systems, and that there are sections where the, the models uh, underlying the two systems are incompatible, but it doesn't become obvious by the axioms of the ontology. So since ontologies only partially specify uh, or partially constrain uh, the intended interpretations and partially render some interpretations uh, um, incorrect, it can still happen that data from system A cannot really be processed by system B. And that you see that all around semantic systems. For example, I recently tried an ontology matching algorithm to match some of my e-commerce ontologies, well, basically two of them, the tickets ontology and e-class all. And the tool suggested that ticket in E-class was equivalent to ticket in the tickets ontology. But in E-class, ticket is a f the physical carrier of the right to enter something. So a plastic badge or something like that, that is a ticket for E-class. And in the tickets ontology, it's even pretty clearly articulated in English, a ticket 
is the right to access some resource. It is not the representation of that right in plastic. It's not definitely not a plastic badge. And, but from the formal account of both ontologies, it's impossible to spot that these are incompatible usages. Now, an ide ideal ontology would constrain the, si the space of possible interpretations so to the actually compatible intersection of the, of the worldviews underlying the systems. But with a finite amount of uh, axioms, it is clearly impossible. And many interesting aspects of data objects are very hard to capture in an axiomatic fashion. Think of a simple property like operating voltage of an electrical device. With rather basic um, formalisms, it's like for example with OL, it is in my opinion impossible to say, that, uh, to, to encode the intended interpretation of operating voltage. In a sense, operating voltage means that if you expose the device to a voltage in that interval, it will work. If you expose it to a voltage above that interval for a certain period of time, it will never work in the future. So you need a notion of time. Um, you need to reason about quantitative properties of intervals. Um, and and all, all that is really difficult um, to encode in logic. But I think we can all agree that ontologies have only a um, quite incomplete formal account of uh, what, they, uh, what, what they should account, um, encode in the historic sense. And we see in a development that many of us have fueled, and myself, uh, well, I don't think I feel guilty for that, by, but I, um, I take the blame for um, having fostered the spread of ontologies that are pretty lightweight, that at most have a lightweight taxonomic structure and maybe a few disjointness axioms, but nothing more. So we are not talking about logical theories, we are talking about basically vocabularies that provide global identifiers for types and maybe a few axioms. And of course, the more lightweight the ontologies get, the more, the farer you get away from this ideal state of the ontology, excluding all possible interpretations. Historically, I read from Guarino's papers that the assumption was that at those times, you were able to infer from the axiomatic account of the ontologies whether two systems were compatible, what was allowed, so that they were rather complete. Now, what we can see today is that computer-based information systems are not close, not in any EU project, not in any practitioner's application, not close to be full knowledge-based systems where the operations are based on a substantial formal account what's going on. So, for example, even rule-based systems uh, in business process management encode only a very small part of the conditions, of the implications, and all that in a rule-based fashion. Which means that the systems are unable to operate solely on the axiomatic theories that underlie, uh, or that should underlie, that should govern that behavior. So, a, a piece of software does something with a data object but it, doesn't real, it cannot really infer whether what is being done is appropriate for that object and it cannot sp spot any contradictions. Well, that may not be not so clear or it, it really hard to convey that, but the core finding for me at this point is that the practical scope of ontologies, in particular web ontologies, but actually in, in most practical applications, the real contribution of ontologies are that they provide a shared type system. So you have types of objects and you have reliable identifiers for the types so that when in some place you encode that an entity is an individual belonging to that type, um, others can operate on that, over that object solely on the declared type membership. So you say this is an apple and you algorithmically eat it. Okay, you just eat it because someone said this is an apple. You don't analyze it whether it tastes strange or is rotten or poisoned or whatever. Someone says this object is of type apple and you apply your algorithm for what do you do with apples, throw at someone or eat it, you, you uh, bite it. And this is, of course, a huge advantage for processing data in an automated fashion because if you, if you have reliable type information about entities, you know which algorithmic um, processing is appropriate and, um, and correct for that object. In fact, 
In my opinion, algorithms are characterized by the fact that they apply the same um, behavior, the same operation to a set of objects of a known type. Automation is characterized by applying the same steps to a set of objects that are similar according to some type. A machine that a stapler can work with a certain set of objects, for example, sheets of paper, and apply a certain thing to that object. If you submit an object that is of an incompatible type to that system, things break. So, for example, if you have any machine and you put something in that breaks the machine, then it is because the process, the call it algorithmic uh, operation, is not suited for that type of object. So it is very valuable for computers to have reliable type information of objects. When you know this is a pizza, then a query for the cheapest pizza in town can list that. And many of the problems that we attribute to insufficient intelligence of systems, uh, many problems in information retrieval can be traced back to the lack of reliable type information. Type information has to be reconstructed by natural language processing, by some other kinds of heuristics, so that you know what to do with these objects. Now, what ontologies can do in computer science, so not in philosophy, in computer science, they can help us improve the reliability of type information for entities in a shared environment. So someone takes schema.org and takes the URI of the class brand or person and says, um, uh, you're a person, or this, per this individual is a person, and then you can apply certain things to that entity because you know it is a person. And you will already see that web ontologies achieve this improvement in reliability of type information in various ways. They can use disjointness axioms to help you gain confidence about the type um, uh, of, a, of uh, an entity. Of course, um, uh, taxonomic relationships help you infer additional types that are reliable. You know that A is a subclass of B, so you know some instance um, of A is also an instance of B, so you get the additional type information, and if that taxonomic structure is reliable, then the additional type information is reliable. Of course, ontologies can also provide some rules that hold implicit facts, like the transitivity of a property. But it's important uh, for me to state that the contribution of the ontology is not solely based on the formal account of the ontology. It's not just the axioms. In particular, web ontologies that have a, a human-readable HTML representation documentation on the web, they help improve the reliability of the type information in various ways. For example, if you have a good textual definition, that helps people grasp the intended meaning of that property or class. By the way, I use type in here for both classes and properties. So properties are also types um, in, in, uh, in, in the, for the remainder of my uh, talk in here. So, or for example, if you have an image, a picture, a photo in an ontology documentation, that may help people apply class membership or type information consistently. Think of college students, they have to classify animals or, um, or fruits. So if they have a textual definition and they are not native uh, um, speakers of English, they may have a hard time classifying all vegetables correctly. But if you show them pictures, they can do so reliably. So web ontologies may use a wealth of modalities for improving the, uh, the type, um, the, the reliability of type information in a shared environment. So what I mean with this improve the reliability of type information is, for example, that you have system one, you have system two, and system one says this in entity is a hotel, and you have a shared type system, and another system relies on that information. But quite clearly, the definition of a hotel may vary. So um, for some people, a hotel starts only at four or five stars, and some other people think that a tent on a camping place is some kind of hotel. Okay? Um, so it's really important that the, um, the intention of types is, uh, has a significant overlap across systems and across people. So an acceptable ontology will, for example, between two people or two systems or two people and two systems which uh, exhibit a behavior similar to that, that the majority of the objects 
um, are in the intersection of the interpretations of that type, of, of the definition of that type by the two systems or by the two individuals. You have very few cases where system A assumes this is a hotel and system B assumes it is not. Okay? A bad ontology would be one like that, where despite the definition of the type in the ontology, you have lots of objects where there is actual disagreement uh, among the humans relying on the systems. So think, for example, uh, we have Italians in the room. Yeah? So, so, for example, I assume that the Italian definition of a cappuccino is very different from the generic European one. So I think in the north of Germany, anybody from the north of Germany? you will still get some lukewarm uh, caffeine-containing uh, beverages that, only, that hardly resemble a cappuccino. So like with a whipped cream on it and uh, uh, chocolate chips on it, and they sell it as a cappuccino. Or I think that the Italian definition of spaghetti carbonara is much narrower than the average um, uh, restaurant definition in parts outside of Italy. So it's quite clear that our, uh, the, the intentions associated with a type are very different across people. And a good ontology will, uh, will achieve um, a, 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 a substantial overlap between the different interpretations. So my, my assumption is, I have not yet worked that out formally so far, but the main contributions of ontologies is that they, mathematical, that, they, that they quantitatively improve the reliability of a type membership function. So like that, that you have a kind of Six Sigma membership function that there are most objects, for most objects, the humans uh, that form the relevant target audience for all the systems agree upon whether an entity is an um, instance of a certain type or is not. So a good pizza ontology or a good wine ontology, uh, you could test that if you ask 100 people, they'd classify the same glass of wine uh, consistently according to that type system. And other means of uh, encoding types, for example, using shared identifiers or any informal uh, techniques, they, the, the working assumption of, of this community seems to be that they, they, they are insufficient to capture that type information. Now, historically, I guess until at least the mid-1990s, and in some minds in the Semeni web community, Ontologies are associated with deterministic computational behavior. So you assume that if you have an ontology underlying the data, underlying the system, that you could execute computational operations over that data in a deterministic manner. You know this is an apple because it's an instance of the class apple in the old ontology, so you could do everything with that instance reliably. No surprises in the system, no exceptions. I'm not saying that this is true, but I say that at least in the beginning people assumed that ontologies would allow um, deterministic processing of data. And you find that mindset often when people assume that you could operate on raw RDF data, you could execute sparkle, simple Sparkle queries to get any meaningful information um, or uh, uh, processing out of data that is on the web. And I think this would, that, 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 that was actually true when the term ontologies was brought into the field. And Michael Uschold may be able to contradict because um, uh, I'm very happy having him attend this talk because uh, he contributed to these early development, de developments. My understanding is that the community at those times were pretty small. You may have had 100 or 500 researchers in artificial intelligence who were interested in sharing their knowledge bases. But you didn't have 100,000 webmasters trying to understand schema.org and hacking a little bit into the HTML. You had um, highly educated, formally educated people in a rather small community. So the important thing is also there were social ties beyond HTTP between the humans exchanging ontologies. 
So you would specify the ontology in some formalism. You'd put it on a floppy disk or put it on the, uh, on the internet, make it available for download. But if someone was unclear about an axiom, you could email or meet at the ECO 1987 conference and discuss things. You knew the people. At least there were some social ties that bound the people using the ontologies beyond an HTTP request against the ontology specification. There were papers, conferences, some kind of shared social context. Now, uh, then came the web. And people borrowed the term again. Anybody knows what this is? That's Dieter Fenzel in his younger years, if Wanker knows, okay. And it became very popular to say, well, these cool ontology, the idea of formal specifications of domain theories is something we need to bring the web to its full potential. I think that's a dairy slogan. Yeah? So, and Inter Enterprise Ireland um, could, took a lot of, and the European Union and all of them, took a lot of money to, to say, like, to, to, to fulfill the vision that Europe suffers from uh, insufficient automation in information processing because of our uh, uh, significant cultural diversity. We have so many human languages and we have so many cultural contexts. So information processing in, in Europe is hampered by the heterogeneity of representation and models and the like. And I think it was a brilliant theme for acquiring funding. And in these early papers, you can clearly see they, they again borrow the term ontologies for increasing the automation of information processing at web scale. However, if the number of humans gets large that use the ontologies, then the whole system of a deterministic specification, uh, 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 um, a type system aimed for deterministic processing turns into a probabilistic system. That means instead of having a black and white true and false one or zero decision whether an instance, whether an individual, whether an entity is of a certain type, you end up having a probability that if you look at an object and you know someone else on the web has encoded is it as an instance of a certain type, then there's a certain likelihood that you share the definition that it is also of that type according to your interpretation. So some restaurant in Berlin marks up his hot beverage as an instance of cappuccino, and you buy it via your semantic iPhone application, and there is a certain likelihood that your definitions of cappuccino overlap sufficiently so that the cappuccino you're buying is in the intersection of your interpretations. So that it is compatible. There's no surprise that you get something that doesn't meet your expectations. So these should be like lots of Venn, Venn diagrams, lots of the, the ellipse in here, that suddenly you, the, the mathematical formulation is not even a sketch in here. This is basically just a reminder for me to explain it. Assume you have a set of agents who use the systems connected via the ontologies. And some of them are sent, one of them is a sender of a message or someone who encodes um, uh, data according to a certain ontology and someone else is a receiver or consumer of, of that entity. And you have a set of objects and then you could have a function that determines whether for a certain object uh, and a certain uh, agent uh, the, uh, this would be an instance of that type or would not. And if you have millions of people doing that, then suddenly it becomes a probability function that the person you're communicating with shares your definition to a, to a sufficient degree. It becomes a game. It becomes a partly random um, operation. So if you order some online drugs, it becomes a random operation whether your definition of headache or flu or so is compatible with the definition of the person offering. So you have to abandon the idea of ontologies empowering, web ontologies empowering systems to um, process data in a deterministic fashion. 
you may get to that point, but this will require substantial cleansing and post-processing, so the raw data and the raw ontologies will not empower you um, to process the data in a deterministic fashion. Um, now, which properties will likely determine the probabilities? So the quality of the membership for function, for example. I suspect that a few relevant dimensions will be the number of individuals of that type. If we have been exposed to many individuals of a certain type, we will be able to classify them more consistently and there will be less um, differences between the interpretations. So I think we all have a pretty shared interpretation of the type banana. So we could reliably classify bananas from a basket of fruits into the same class. Everybody in this room here. With a papaya, I myself, I'm not even sure. And if it gets to very specific species, very specific animals, like we have a taxonomy of bugs, and we were to collect the bugs in our hotel and classify them according to that taxonomy, we may have a much lesser um, conformance, a much lesser quality of our um, joint assessment. Then, the cognitive skills of the involved humans will play a role. Educated co uh, conceptual modelers will have no problem distinguishing a book copy from a book title. By lay person encoding web pages, we'll probably have difficulties following these subtle conceptual distinctions. Um, in fact, I think one of the outcomes of academic education, one of the most important outcomes of academic education to humans is that they develop a way more sophisticated type system so that they are able to classify phenomena they, they perceive according to a more granular type system so they could trigger more appropriate actions. So lay people can probably say this is an oil on canvas and this is not oil on canvas and someone who studied art for a decade a PhD in the history of art can probably from, tell from the direction of brushes whether this was uh, a painter from the Netherlands or from the UK. So education is about developing sophisticated type systems and sophisticated type systems allow for more intelligent behavior. <laughs> and the cognitive skills and training of involved humans limits the ability to follow conceptual distinctions. There will be many other variables we don't know yet that influence the ability of humans to consistently apply a type system to a set of objects. And I think there are a few fallacies in the context of web ontologies. So one fallacy is that many assume that formal specifications would guarantee correct usage. So that if an ontology is used wrongly, people classify an object wrongly according to the type system of that ontology, it is because the ontology is underspecified. So for example, good relations has very few axioms and if people use a class wrongly, then it is because I don't have an axiomatic theory underlying all elements. However, I think that's a severe fallacy because even a fully specified, formally specified ontology does not guarantee that humans judging phenomena and typing them according to the type system do that correctly because humans don't, most humans are not able to process a set, an axiomatic theory, to apply an axiomatic theory to the task of classifying instances. So even if you formally specify the intention, that doesn't guarantee that it's even completely unclear whether an axiomat uh, axiomatic theory improves the membership function of an ontology used at web scale by tens of thousands of people. This is why, for example, the schema.org people, they don't have any formal axioms in the ontologies, a very lightweight model. They try to use lots of examples and textual definitions. And Ramanathan Guha, one of the leads of schema.org, is proud that the word semantics doesn't appear anywhere on the schema.org webpage. He claims that, at least. I'm not sure whether in the FAQs there may be semantic, actually. But so, in fact, I don't think there is serious evidence that formal specifications guarantee or even contribute to the correct usage to a better uh, type membership function. 
a better membership function. The second fallacy I see is that people assume that web ontologies allow for the automated processing of data. I think this is, this, that is very, a very common assumption. Um, and I get many requests from people who ask, where is the Sparkle endpoint that I could query against all the e-commerce data based on good relations on the web? And I know from the collaboration with Google that they have to apply an armada of computational systems of various kinds, rule-based systems, heuristics, machine learning, everything, to basically filter and improve and enhance the raw data. So the, the, the web ontologies are not schemas in the sense of database schemas where basically they are very close to the computational processing of the data. They are something in between. They are something in between the humans encoding data and the machines doing something with it. A database schema in a relational database is very closely tied to the database. It is the last point of interface between the humans and the, the representation suited for computer processing. A web ontology is a means for channeling uh, the, uh, represent the encoding of information by a vast amount of people. So, but the important message in here is that data cleansing and entity consolidation and data quality management for this data is not a small add-on on the semantic web layer cake, something that you could do when you've done the basic homework. I basically think, and I've thought for some while, that the data quality issue um, is fundamental, it's a, it should be a fundamental component of using data from the web, and I was happy, in a sense happy, uh, as a confirmation, and sad for like the lack of novelty of my own thought, that Stuart Maddick, the pretty well-known researcher in uh, uh, data and information at MIT, has written in 2003 already a very nice technical report that's uh, titled, entitled, oh, so that's what you meant, the interplay of data quality and data semantics. And I think this is not a byproduct, a small fine-tuning of semantic web applications, semantic systems in general, but it is at the core of doing anything in, um, in an environment where we have large amounts of shared data structures. Now a few recommendations for research and practice derived from this sketchy talk. So first of all, we should think about the role of shared schemas um, between man and machines. With that I mean that historically schemas were very close to the digital representation, to the, to the databases. You define a database schema to allow a database management system to operate on the data and it guaranteed some computational properties of that. For example, the uniqueness of primary keys guaranteed something or you could, um, by a good schema design, you could guarantee a certain degree of normalization of the data and so you could have, um, you'd have reliable um, uh, characteristics um, of the resulting representation. And web ontologies are, in a sense, much more in between human users and computer systems. They don't sit at the triple store and allow to express a pretty neat Sparkle query, but they are some funnel for consolidating by helping people to collaboratively represent information in a way that is easier to process. For example, to preserve data structures so that um, Data structure doesn't have to be reconstructed by a consumer. Computers are pretty bad at tokenizing units of meaning. The NLP people were contradicting here, but in general, humans can easily spot the components of an address. For computer systems, it's pretty difficult to reliably split the street number, the, the, uh, the building number, from the street name, in an international context at least, where you also have numbers as part of the street names and that. So it is very valuable if you can preserve a data structure um, in the representation. So again, web ontologies sit between the humans and the computer systems, and they, my opinion is that web ontologies are a reinterpretation of the term, a second reinterpretation, a second borrowing of the term ontologies. So same as the computer scientists took the word 
ontologies from philosophy because it was a catchy word for, some, for a component, for a technique that they needed. Web ontologies take the idea of ontologies from computer science in the 1990s and apply it to a new context where certain paradigms surprisingly do no longer hold because the number of peoples are huge and the interaction between ontology designer and um, ontology users is limited to a, an HTTP GET request, RFC 2616, the HTTP specification, recommended reading for any of your junior students. I think it's the, we should market it as the constitution of the, uh, of the web. But that's a side comment. Now, what we should do, in my opinion, is we should test quantitatively how well a target audience can understand and apply the conceptual distinctions in our ontology. So we should use Amazon Mechanical Turk tasks, present design alternatives to a large amount of humans, show them entities, have them classify it, and measure the quality of their conform the conformance of the usage. And you will see that certain classes can be easily applied in a consistent manner and others cannot. We all know that certain conceptual distinctions are very valuable for the later processing. This is why all of us in here, and I include myself, who think that the philosophical grounding is very valuable to empower computational processing of the data. So we sometimes fight hard for distinctions like book copy and book title, and legal entity and shop or web page versus the entity described by the page, that the Wikipedia page about John Lennon is not John Lennon, and that the McDonald's store is not the same as the uh, McDonald's limited company that operates the restaurant and the like. So we know that they are often, these distinctions are valuable for the reuse and processing of the data. That is clear. But what we don't know, by and large, is the cost that this distinct, these distinctions put, or the burden that these put on a large audience of users who want to encode data. So, for example, when we introduce a new distinction to schema.org, they are currently um, considering to uh, have a nicer modeling of creative works so that you have abstract creative works, you have manifestations of the creative works, so that you can clearly distinguish between the book title, a book title written by Shakespeare, a certain version of that one and a physical copy, which empowers a uh, more powerful reuse of data. But on the other hand, if you look at Joe the web developer finding the proper type in the uh, system, it gets more complicated and it may mean that they produce less data because they think, well, I, I can't figure that out, I just leave that type out of my markup. It can be that the quality of the, the reliability of the type membership goes down because they randomly pick one, because it validates in the rich snippet testing tool, so it must be correct. Um, and so we need to learn about the trade-offs between the, the, the entropy, the, conceptual, the, the, the value of conceptual distinctions on one hand, and the impact on the usage of our type system by the target audiences. And we can measure that. We could uh, pre face test audiences with objects, have them type the objects according to our uh, to multiple variants of our ontology, and measure the the quality of the membership function, the social quality of the membership. The how does it impact the probability that a random pair of people understand uh, agree upon whether an object is a member of that type or is not. And this could turn ontology engineering from an art into an empirical science. And I've seen for almost nine years with unease that ontology engineering was, was dominated by the formal aspects of encoding knowledge. That is an important part. But you need to take into account the interface between human minds and your type system, and you need to monitor that in a scientific way. You need to apply quantitative um, uh, techniques to monitor that what you are modeling is good. And that follow, from that follows that we should optimize ontologies in the sense that we compare, I think I said that already, that we compare the discriminative value of your conceptual elements, your, your more fine-grained ontology, your Dolce, your UBO, your top-level distinctions, 
with their effect on conformant ontology usage and the effect on what kind of processing they empower. A more powerful type system, as said, empowers more powerful processing. This holds for man and machine alike. But this does only hold if the, a, a more sophisticated type system is only more valuable for processing if it doesn't negatively affect the, the data quality, the, the uh, reliability of type uh, uh, membership. So what I think we should do is we should capture live feedback on the quality of the membership functions of our ontologies. We should, see, we should take random samples of data and see whether people expose uh, or mark up um, content correctly and use that to compare design alternatives. And I think we are facing at least five challenges when building web ontologies. First of all, we have to improve, uh, we, have the, we have the goal to improve the reliability of class membership of entities in information processing. And it is a little bit unclear what are the appropriate means for that. Does all help us achieve that goal? I think that's a completely open question. There's, for example, a bunch of research uh, in a field called terminology research where people have thought about 50 years about the proper naming of types so that humans across cultural contexts can understand what is being meant. That is rooted in international trade in the 1950s, 1960s. There's even a, a, a Terminet research facility in Vienna who basically think about like how should you name types of products, types of things, so that it can be well translated across cultural um, environments. Then we have to find categories, classes, types that provide sufficient distinctions for an algorithmic information processing so that we minimize reclassification tasks at the recipient side. It is clear that the granularity of the type system constrains our ability to do automated processing with it. If the ontology doesn't provide distinctions that we need for <laughs> processing the objects at the, uh, in the target system. We have to reclassify them so little is gained by the ontology. Uh, the same holds for data granularity. We have to find levels of data granularity in the ontology that are easy to populate um, and uh, maximize uh, the, the usage of the data. For example, should an address, an ontology that has the type address and the properties, uh, properties for the components of an address, should it have two properties for street name and street number or one? If you have one, you make it easier for people to populate the ontology. If you have two, you make it easier for people to compute the distance between two street numbers. There's a trade-off between the data granularity. Then you have to find categories that can be populated from existing data sources without reclassification tasks at the publisher side. I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's a big mistake to build web ontologies that require, that are powerful, but require the owners of substantial data sources to do anything to improve, reclassify, cleanse their data before annotating stuff. So for example, if they have addresses only in an unstructured format, you must provide means for them to expose them as they are. If you have shops and they have 10,000 products, don't require them to classify all products according to basic distinctions like product or service. A typical shop has, like, say, 1,000 items, 900 of them are tangible products, and 100 of them are uh, added services that you can buy. So if your ontology has a fierce distinction between product and service because they are ontologically distinct types, then you force them to reclassify their whole shop items before they can use your ontology, which puts an enormous barrier to adopting your conceptual structure. So you have to find categories that are a nice trade-off in between that. And then you have to find conceptual distinctions that can be mastered reliably by the human stakeholders of the system. And this system is pretty big when you talk about web ontologies. Now, again, I think <coughs> there have been two passages. The first passage was from philosophy to computer science fostering the exchange of knowledge based in a kind of controlled academic setting with a limited amount of people who, whose social interaction is not limited to HTTP GET requests. And then we have the web as an ecosystem for shared schemata where you have lots of stakeholders uh, 
for example, the schema designers, typically a few, data consumers, they set the incentive. For example, if Google says, I honor good relations markup, people are interested in good relations markup. And you have to cater for their requirements. So, for example, the conceptual distinctions you offer should support their processing tasks. And you have the data publishers, the site owners, many, often dump, don't take it as an insult, it just they, they have different qualifications, um, whom you want to uh, get aboard. You want to convince them to publish data, to expose data according to your schema. So you must make it for them as simple as possible and as rewarding as possible to adopt your ontology. So my claim in this talk is that web ontologies are not ontologies in the traditional sense, but at least a very specific variant of ontologies, if not, and that's actually my understanding, a completely new form um, of ontologies. Because you have a huge unknown community of users to whom you speak only while the web resources that represent, that specify the ontology. Only your uh, old file and your HTML file and your wiki and the like. And I know what I'm talking of because good relations, documenting good relations um, has taken maybe a decade of uh, human labor so far. So 10 man years for just 28 classes and 30 properties. Um, you have economic factors. And because the, you have an, an, a very open, broad system, the economic factors are way more important than in a setting where you can use other means to motivate people to use your ontology. For example, in a small research environment, you can convince people that this helps them do more research. You can talk to them. You can give some kind of data as, an, as a reward for them or make them co-author your paper. There are other many social means for motivating people to probably use your ontology. Um, but at web scale, if you have to do with many people who use the web to achieve a business purpose, for example, getting more visibility in search engines and the like, the incentives um, compared to the costs become a very, very important, uh, get a very, very important role. And of course, the strong incentives also set strong incentives for spam so that the quality of the membership function is no longer only limited by misunderstandings, but also by malicious activity. Um, you have huge data quality issues. And I said, I think the data quality management the, 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 the challenges are 50% of the task of making the semantic web a reality. And I see it with really with huge surprise that data quality management is not even in the semantic web layer cake. And we're not talking about trust, the trust layer. It's not about signing documents using uh, any kind of... Uh, uh, algorithmic methods. It is way deeper. It's about guaranteeing the conformance of the usage and the, any aspect. I mean, data quality research is a big topic. I won't speak about this in here. We have, of course, huge amounts of data. For example, it's a completely untested assumption that you can crawl the semantic web data in the available amount of time so that you can do anything meaningful with a consolidated view. Uh, you may, my, some of you have me, may, may have seen my debate with Chris Bietzer and some others about the web data commons. And they take the common crawl, which is a crawl of the web, a freely available one, and extract structured data. And then they say, you don't have to crawl the web. You can just take our RDF dumps and then query the web as a, as a whole. And I could show that the common crawl doesn't reach deep enough into the detailed pages of huge sites. So they don't reach the pages that actually have the rich markup, so that, for example, it only contains 20,000 good relations offerings, where I, with a random sample, can point them to 20 million such entities. And the web is bigger than the common crawl, but they are searching in the wrong corner. It's like the Soviets flying uh, to the space, and I think they, they, later on, Gagarin was forced to say, I didn't see God, it wasn't there. So this is not a claim that God doesn't exist, quite obviously. Um, so I think the Web Data Commons guys look into the wrong corner of it. Of course, they did good work, and it's all that can be achieved with reasonable means. Crawling at web scale is a tremendous task. Um, but it's an, a completely open question whether we can do it with the available resources, in, the, in particular in the available amount of time, and for which uh, and part, types of data it is possible. I think Gerd Wycombe had this in the uh, ISWC talk, uh, where he said, like, the linked data cloud and all the celebrating that 
the semantic web is now finally working works only in the field with encyclopedic data that is uh, encyclopedic information that is pretty stable. I mean the birth date of John Lennon doesn't change on a daily basis but the amount of hotels available in the Radisson in Galway changes on an hourly basis so crawling it from RDFA and in, well that's that's a different story. Um, also you have to take, to take into account the limitations of deployment environments. In many cases in big corporations you cannot apply the linked data principles in the pure sense because people don't have sufficient access to the server configuration, they don't have the skills or they have corporate policies that prevent that. For example, touching who knows what HD access is, the Apache file for configuring content negotiation the like, okay. Now we all know that this is a typical re recipe for deploying linked data, but on a corporate server of Volkswagen, Best Buy and the like, they will kill you if you touch the HD access or even create an HD access file. Because you can do many, many, many bad things with, with that file. And for example, huge corporate sites use content delivery networks and uh, uh, complex components for band managing big, big requests like, uh, for example, uh, having multiple redundant servers and doing load management with that. Many of the recipes are really hard to implement if um, you follow the, uh, the deployment recipes published by the W3C. So these challenges we had. This is an old illustration from my possible ontology paper from uh, possible ontologies paper from 2007 and that already shows that the, the problem with web ontologies is that you have an ontology engineering community and you have ontology users and at web scale they communicate only via the specification, via the HTML and all files and that creates an ontology perspicuity bottleneck that users cannot really communicate very well with, um, with the creators of the ontology to clarify the intended meaning. The paper also contains some preliminary discussions about ontology economics. One of the fundamental claims made back then was that a web ontology must be small because um, the amount of people who will be willing to study an ontology and apply it is uh, inversely correlated with the effort for doing so. So many people are willing to spend half a day of for learning schema.org, few people are willing to uh, study UBO or Dolce for one year prior to marking up their web pages. There's a simple demand curve. And you can see that actually most of the popular web ontologies are pretty small. Of course, this is not an absolute truth because the exact uh, layout of the demand curve depends on the incentives. So if you have a huge incentives like Google giving you more visibility, then you can have a bigger schema. But when building an ontology as a researcher in here, keep in mind that typically your ability to set incentives is small. So make it as simple as possible for people to use it. There's of course a maintenance problem, I won't speak about that, but this was also by the way an eco paper. Uh, um. Now what, what constitutes Web ontologies. I think you can only speak of a web ontology if you have at least 500 users, 500 institutions, sites, domain names using the ontology. So if two universities use the ontology in a project, it's not an ontology. It's some kind of shared schema, but not a web ontology. They must be understandable and usable just from the web presence. So please don't take Protégé hack a quick ontology, upload it via FTP, post the link via Twitter and then go away with it. As said, of the 10 man years of building good relations, the majority goes into documenting the whole thing. You should try to decouple the ontology from the evolution of enumerations. So please don't define all possible car features in the ontology. Rather defer that to a later point or externalize that using DBP their reference or something that evolves quickly. Because you can never maintain a finite set of uh, values for these enumerations in your ontology. Try to allow what I call dynamic data granularity and incremental refinement. That means don't enforce a rigid level of data granularity in your ontology. Don't force people to separate street name and street number. Provide a means so that they can preserve the granularity they have, but are never forced to tokenize to structure the data before populating it. So good relations has various means that you can always put textual elements to the next higher level node to preserve the information in unstructured form if you cannot populate the more granular ones. 
Um, then there's something that I call deferred consensus. Many ontologies aim at standardizing as much as possible. For example, you have a real estate ontology and you try to standardize all room features or hotel ontology. This is uh, bound to failure in my opinion because having global consensus on such features like star rating or, yeah, hotel star rating is a good example. A naive definition, sorry, I'm taking a little bit over time. I will finish this very soon. Um, star rating is a good example. There are at least five standards for hotel star ratings. Now, if when building your ontology, you try to standardize what the whole business of tour the tourism industry has tried to standardize for two decades, you will not be successful. So rather than trying to define one, consist uh, one consolidated definition, provide means for articulating the local view on it. Good relations will get with the next re uh, release, will get a feature for s encoding simple property value pairs instead of enforcing standardized product features because we found that it is many people, many shops have property value pairs for product features. So they know this is operating voltage and they have a value and sometimes they have even a unit. But they are, you cannot re request them to consolidate their meaning into a target um, type system, so uh, we want them to prefer that. I had originally promised to write a paper accompanying this talk. Unfortunately, I failed, but all the ideas will sooner or later be fully elaborated in the uh, resulting paper. Um, yeah, You should minimize namespace traversals. So I'm not a fan of mixing many ontologies. So having eight prefixes and use them in your markup and that, because from the perspective of ergonomics, that ris uh, increases the risk of error. People will use the fourth prefix when they mean doubling core and the like. So in many cases, it is better to define a local variant of that, for example, fourth friend class in your local ontology, map it to the other ontology, so that at least for web ontologies that are used in an HTML environment, namespace traversals are avoided. Mixing ontologies is good, but namespace traversals um, are a price for that. So it is not, using many different vocabularies in parallel is not a good thing per se. The semantic web community has yielded four or five ontologies for encoding street name and zip code. WeCard, 3.0, WeCard, 2008, schema.org, I think FOV also has properties for that. There's no gain in confusing owners of data um, about which property to use for that. <laughs> and minimize the number of conceptual elements. Then I would like to close with how can community involvement be implemented in a web ontology? I think we have historically two strands. The one group says like elite ontologists, ontology engineers build an ontology, clever people, it's difficult, we do it, we enforce it on the world, they should use it. Then we had this big stream of community-driven ontology engineering. I must say, admit, I uh, once uh, felt victim to, to this idea that lay people could evolve schemas in wikis by themselves and I drastically underestimated, well this is to say it in a polite way, I, I drastic, dr dramatically overestimated the ability of lay people to channel their domain knowledge into useful conceptual structures. Conceptual modeling is a very very difficult art and it takes a decade to learn that in a good way. And what you need from the community is input on whether they understand the types and suggestions for new types. But for example, spotting similarities in types that are just have different namings, so that things are named differently in two domains, but they mean the same thing. That is something that you cannot expect from the domain experts. And I, I learned that I was wrong when I was asked to upload good relations in such a wiki and have the community evolve it. And I said, okay, I spent so much time. No, please, don't, don't let the community spoil this consistent model. Um, so you can do community-driven ontology engineering. You can do community-inspired ontology engineering. They like give you just suggestions. And you could use just social functionality. And I want to show you this for closing. So what we do in Good Relations now is a mix of centralized ontology engineering. I call myself the benevolent dictator of Good Relations for life. So I approve of all suggestions and model stuff completely on my own. But what, I, what we added recently was a lot of social functionality so that users of the ontology can um, interact 
with me or with us directly. For example, for each conceptual element, you have social media buttons. That sounds very familiar to you, but I think applying it to ontology documentations, it is new because you can tweet about each class and each property individually. So if you click on the Twitter button in here, it will create a predefined message that says, I just found the GR has currency property and share it with your fellow people. Or with Facebook, you can refer your fellow developer to that class. So this is not at the level of the vocabulary, but it's at the level of the vocabulary element so that you get a richer social channel for improving the community understanding of these conceptual elements and learning of any problems. Then we have, you see that in gray, it's hard to see in here, it, there's a, a question uh, uh, mark. Ask a question related to this element. With one click of a button, you can ask a customized question in popular developer forums like Stack Overflow and Answers at semanticweb.com and Quora and the like. So you can say, I have a question about pricing in good relations with one click of a button. And again, you're always at the level of a single conceptual element. You're not saying, I have a question about good relations. You say, I have a question about the has currency property in good relations. Um, then, of course, we give domain and range in that. We have links and references to detailed discussions, and we provide examples in three syntaxes, and they are all handcrafted for maximizing the educational value. So we maintain about 400 examples, 130 examples in three syntaxes in parallel for all elements so that you can always have a copy and paste example for this particular thing. You cannot generate them automatically. You cannot even do the translations between the syntaxes in an automated fashion. You can do that, but the results are unreadable and uninstructive examples because, for example, the serializers uh, randomly change the order of elements or they take cryptic blank node identifiers and the like. So we maintain all that. Uh, in a human readable fashion. Same holds for UML class diagram, which has proved to be very useful for <laughs> instructing uh, users at web scale how to uh, employ an ontology. I draw that in OmniGraffle, a drawing tool, because I've not found any useful um, tool that can derive a nice and po uh, uh, UML class diagram that can be post-processed. Okay, then user's guide and all that, a lot of effort. This is an example of the community of experts. So you, when you click on the, I have a question, then it generates this template at Stack Overflow and you can say, I have a question about this good relations element. That's it. So thanks for your time. If you have any questions, probably ask by Twitter or at lunchtime. I will be around for the remainder of the day and I will also am um, happy to answer questions online. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the invitation. Have a great conference. And apologies for the extra time. So thanks for the enlightening talk. So, well, we are a bit late, so I would say we go to the coffee break and then you have questions and approach in there. The coffee break is upstairs, so we need to go over to the deck later. Uh, follow me. Thanks.